Attorney General Holder, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate sure. it. Sure. Um, and I, I look forward to this conversation because I don't think, uh, you know, redistricting or vote, I don't, especially redistricting or gerrymandering. I think it's something, especially on our end at Aldea, which deals with the Latinx community. I don't think it's something a lot of people talk about. You know, it's not something people know a lot about. I mean, I think I think voting in general is a is a is something that is still on the up and up in the Latinx community. But I want to start there, sure, um, because I think because I think that you know people don't know what redistricting is or you know what's what goes on around it. I mean, if you were to explain to me as somebody who doesn't really know what it is, where would you start that discussion? Ooh, okay. Um, well, I'd say that you know just kind of breaking it down. I mean, every 10 years we conduct a national census. Um, the constitution requires us to do that. Uh, the states then use that population data to um, redraw electoral lines for the United States House of Representatives, but also importantly for, um, for state legislatures. So we redistrict as a country, um, but it's done on a, uh, on a local basis. You know, the, the, make leaders, the makeup of the House of Representatives is actually design, is designed by, um, by state legislatures. And, you know, we run into a problem when politicians manipulate that process uh, to do what's called gerrymandering. Now, you know, gerrymandering at its most basic level is just cheating. It's when one political party manipulates the electoral maps that it's drawing in a way that benefits their party at the expense of the people and at the uh, expense of, of the other party. Um, you know, gerrymandering weakens our democracy um, by making some voters' uh, ballots more powerful than others and by, by eliminating truly competitive elections. That's really kind of one of the aims of gerrymandering, to make sure that you have these, these safe seats. Um, gerrymandering allows pay politicians to cater um, to special interests, the extremes of their party, um, rather than the people they're supposed to represent. And there's no electoral consequence to that because they're in these safe seats. That leads to um, polarization, it leads to gridlock, and it leads to you know, a general dissatisfaction with, um, as, as people have expressed in our, you know, in our political system. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, we, you, you talk about, I mean, you, you start with the census because the census is what you know, has the, the, the basis, you know, is what the basis of, of redistricting is on. Um, and, and, and I think a big thing we've talked about, you know, leading into the 2020 census is, is like the risk of the 2020 census not being complete and not being a complete picture to sort of redistrict correctly. Um, and, and, and on your end, as, as part of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, um, you know, how, what are, you know, your concerns with the 2020 census regarding, um, you know, redistricting efforts that you're trying to do? Yeah, that's an important question, and, and it's one that we don't spend enough time um, focused on. I mean, we need, you know, first of all, we need a full and accurate census count to have a fair redistricting process. And the, the, the census is kind of the, the foundation for fair redistricting. I mean, people and communities who are not counted um, uh, in, in the census will not have representation that's drawn in a way that it, it's supposed to be. So when the new maps are drawn, communities won't get the representation that they um, are, are supposed to get. Uh, it's, it's important to start talking about, you know, redistricting now because this is, you know, we only do this once in a decade. It'll happen in 2021. And we have to make sure that the lines are, are, are drawn fair. But over the last decade, we've seen what happens when you have political gerrymandering. Uh, Republicans went to town in, in 2011, and we've had to deal with that um, that gerrymandering over the course of the past um, the past you know past past decade. But a census count is really important. We've got to make sure that for the distribution of um, uh, federal funds, about $1.5 trillion, again, decided on, on the census data, in addition to the reapportionment thing, uh, you have to make sure that all communities are counted. And I think it's really telling that uh, the Trump administration has done things, I think, um, to try to um, lower the count, um, decrease the number of people in the uh, Latinx community. Um, you know, by including on the cent or an attempt to include on the, the census form a citizenship question, which my organization sued uh, to oppose and was ultimately um, vindicated in the court. So th that will not be included. And now we have an executive order from the president that says that uh, the count should not in include um, should not include immigrants. And so you know, there's it's there's a whole range of things 
that this administration has done to ensure that the census uh, is not an accurate one, that it's more pro-Republican than it should be, and in particular, that it does not include um, members of the Latinx community. How, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you talk about how you've sued and have succeeded in getting the citizenship question off of the, um, you know, off of the, the census. But overall, like, do you, do you think those efforts will prove to be successful or not? Yeah, I mean, I think that legally we have certainly um, taken out of the census some really objectionable um, questions that would have had an impact, the impact of um, lowering responses, increased the level of fear that um, um, people would have had, again, in, in especially in the, the Latinx community, uh, where you potentially have, you know, mixed households, people who are documented, people who are not, and you're concerned that if you raise your hand um, to be counted, you might be putting at risk uh, other people in, in the household. But I think I, we also have to acknowledge that um, this administration, through the census effort and through the other things that you've heard this president talk about from the day that he announced his candidacy, um, very anti-immigrant, uh, very anti-Latinx, and that has created, I think, a climate of, uh, of fear and I worry about what's the impact of that climate of fear when it comes to doing a full, robust, and inaccurate um, census. You know, I've, I've been out there, and other folks have been out there trying to, to counteract that um, that clear, that fear-inducing climate. Um, and I hope you know that we have been successful because the reality is, uh, for the Latinx community, for the African American community, um, for, for the whole communities of color they have to have, we have to have uh, a fair census if we want to have fair redistricting, if we want to have a fair distribution of federal funds for things like healthcare, education, um, infrastructure. Even, you know, the private sector uses census data to decide where they're going to locate businesses, where factories are, are going to be built. There's a huge amount um, that is dependent on a fair, complete, and accurate census. Yeah, and and, and then... And my other follow-up to that is you know i mean you meant we mentioned we talked about how all the all the efforts the administration's done but then you know throw a pandemic in there um you know what have you seen in terms of the effect of, of COVID 19 on this whole process i mean it slowed it down it pushed it back but now we've kind of have we, we kind of have a hard deadline now at the end of september so yeah. you know how has that been on your end well it's um it's been it's been problematic you know the doing the census has typically been um, a nonpartisan thing. Um, the last census that occurred in 2010, um, I was a part of the Obama Justice Department, led the, the Obama Justice Department, and the handoff from uh, the Bush administration to the Obama administration was really kind of seamless. There's always been this feeling that the census is a, is a nonpartisan um, thing. Now, with um, the Trump administration trying to make it a partisan thing, we're trying to use it for partisan advantage and trying to disadvantage the Latinx community, you now have the you know, COVID, COVID-19. And so that inhibits the ability of the census to do the, the field work that you would expect it to do, which is to knock on doors when people don't return census forms, to knock on doors, to count people in various households. You can't do that in the middle of a, of a pandemic. And so a request was made from the Census Bureau to delay um, the time in which, um, by which they had to um, report the, the, their data. The Trump administration initially agreed to that and it seemed like everything was going along fine. Things were gonna be moved until uh, the last day in October. Now the Trump administration has changed their minds and they wanna go back and end the counting at the end of, uh, at the end of September. And I have to think this is again for political purposes, the, the thought being that if they have a, an abbreviated count, there will not be um, an adequate enumeration of uh, Latinx community, the African American co communities, and that will help them um, help them politically. So, but the, the census has really been impacted by um, by COVID nineteen. But there are there are measures that seemingly were agreed to that would have extended the time for for the count. Now the Trump administration is going against its own initial position and saying they want to cut off the uh, the counting prematurely. Right, and 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 you you talk about like the the political the politicization of this whole process and how you know you mentioned how in, in 2010 how this, the handoff was seamless, but now it's sort of you know it, it's a, it's a, it's a two party thing. It's very partisan. It's polarized. 
is there anything you know going forward you know like maybe not this census but in a future census where um i mean and i think this ties into redistricting too because i think redistricting is is very is a very partisan thing too sometimes um you know is there anything that could be done about the process in general that would get rid of that sort of partisan bend or is it just really the leaders that are in charge that need to change in order for that to change you know, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, there's a there's a nonpartisan structure that's in place, the Census Bureau, um, which is a part of the Department of Commerce. It's always been staffed by professionals. And up until this census effort, it had always been done in a nonpartisan way, you know, from Republican administrations to Democratic administrations. It is this administration that made a determination. It's for political advantage. And they try to come up with ways in which they could skew the, the census count for their own um, political interests. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that there's the need for structural change as much as there is the need to put in place, you know, at the highest levels of our government, um, people who understand the norms that, um, that govern the way in which, uh, you know, the, the government interacts with the people, the norms about the way in which um, the government goes about um, its constitutionally mandated um, business. Um, I hope that what we're seeing now is an aberration. Uh, I would hate to think, I mean, I would really hate to think that we're now going to, you know, infect the, the, the census count with, um, you know, political considerations. It's just simply not been the case. I mean, there was a, a slight blow up, I guess, back in 1920. There were some problems there, but that's about the only one where you have not seen um, a census count go off just as it should have under the auspices, you know, of the, those career people at the, uh, at the Census Bureau. Right, right. Um, yeah, and, and I think that goes right into my next line of questioning, which is going to be about, like, uh, you know, your, your record on, on voting rights and, and, you know, your fight for voting rights. And then we'll go back to the, you know, what you, what you led the conversation with about, about gerrymandering. Um, you know, because gerrymandering has been around before this administration. I mean, I think I feel like it may just be exaggerated. It may be more exaggerated right. under yeah. this administration. Um, but, you know, you know in, in your experience, just, just to sort of get some tangible examples, what are some, like, recent examples of gerrymandering that have, like, severely impacted, you know, certain elections around the country? Well, you can look back at the 2018 election. Um, the Associated Press did an analysis of the 2018 election. And if people think of that as a blue wave, you know, Democrats, uh, overwhelming victories there. Well, you know, because of gerrymandering, um, and done by the Republicans in, in 2011, um, AP did a study and, and found out that Democrats would have won an additional 16 seats in the United States House of Representatives if there had been no gerrymandering, and they would Democrats would have flipped an additional seven state legislative chambers if there had been um, no gerrymandering. And, and the same is true. You look at the state legislative um, at state legislative level. You know, again, concrete examples: Democrats won more votes for state legislatures in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina, in Michigan, and in Wisconsin but were unable to take control of any of those chambers. You know, Democrats got more votes than Republicans. Republicans remained in control. I guess in, um, in, uh, in, in Wisconsin, you know, Democrats got, I think like 54% of the vote or something like that, and only got one third, you know, one third of, of the seats. And so that is, those are very tangible examples of the impact of, uh, of partisan and racial gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And, and and, and speaking on, you know, you know, expanding on that, I mean, like, how does, how does the gerrymandering, you know, how does, how does gerrymandering contribute to that sort of politicized environment, polarized environment that we're in today? Well, um, we, you know, the number one objective of politicians is to get reelected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's rule one. Uh, when politicians represent a gerrymandered seat, they're more concerned not with a general election, they're concerned with a primary challenge. If they're in a safe seat, they're going to win. Whoever the Republican is, whoever the Dem Democrat's going to win, they're going to win the general election. So you're concerned about a primary challenge. Uh, and that means they're more likely, uh, politicians are more likely to serve the extremes of their party and the special interests than the people in their, in their districts. Um, you know, I mean, give you an example. I mean, in, in, in 2013, at the beginning of President Obama's second term, there was a bipartisan group in the Senate passed a comprehensive immigration reform bill. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it was, it was pretty good. Uh, it passed the Senate, but the bill couldn't even get a vote in the House of Representatives. John Boehner was a speaker at the time, and he was scared of the Freedom Caucus. 
many of those people in the Freedom Caucus, the most extreme part of the Republican Party, came from these, rep these, um, these gerrymandered districts. Same thing with, with Medicaid expansion. You look at the states that have the most gerrymandered legislatures, and they're the ones who have refused to expand coverage, um, Medicaid um, coverage to more people. And they do these things knowing that there's great support for Medicaid expansion, great support for comprehensive immigration reform, oppose it, but if you're in a safe seat, you don't have any electoral um, consequence. The only thing you're concerned about is a, um, is a primary challenge, and therefore you want to protect your, if you're in the Republican Party, uh, uh, protect your right flank. Right, right. And another thing, another, another question on that is, I mean, I know when you were Attorney General, you, uh, you sued uh, a state, you sued, I think it was Alabama, right? You sued Alabama for... Uh, uh, the way in which uh, the district was gerrymandered. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, you know, I, other than, I mean, other than like what we're talking about in terms of redistricting and filling out the census and getting those in order, uh, you know, is, is there something an attorney general or those in, in power can do to combat that just like in the moment where maybe it's still gerrymandered? Well, you know, I'm, I, I think, you know, our political leadership could stand for of the reforms that I've been fighting for um, since I've been the chairman of the NDRC, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, um, you know, put in place, for instance, instance these nonpartisan um, commissions to actually draw the lines. Instead of having self-interested politicians draw the lines, have these independent commissions um, draw them. Wherever the people have the ability to choose between letting politicians do it or putting in place uh, a nonpartisan commission. The people always choose to have a, a nonpartisan um, commission do it. The Supreme Court has made it difficult uh, to bring partisan gerrymandering um, lawsuits in the federal courts. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that those are not cases that um, can be brought in, in the federal courts. And so we've had to bring these cases now in the state courts. And um, so that makes it difficult for federal officials uh, to really get into to gerrymandering unless the gerrymandering is done on a racial basis. There, you can still bring um, federal cases, but you can't bring federal cases when it uh, comes to partisan uh, partisan gerrymandering. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, another question about gerrymandering. I mean, we talk about how. I mean, and 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 this could tie into to voting rights too. I mean, we talk about how gerrymandering does it, but but like even in even if they can't do partisan, they can't charge on partisan means, it still ends up being often affecting the, the communities of color that are often excluded by this, uh, by, by this practice. And I, I don't know, in my reporting sometimes, you know, I, I go out into, you know, the Latinx communities in North Philadelphia, um, and, and, I, and I've talked to many people who, you know, are would-be voters or who, who would vote. And oftentimes, like, there's, there's this disconnect with, like, the people that are in power, and, and often there's like a lack of belief in the system. How do you explain gerrymandering, which is, as you said, a cheating of the system to somebody who already feels cheated by the system? Yeah, you know, it's, it's tough um, because gerrymandering really does have an impact um, on the worth of a particular person's vote. You know, if you're in a gerrymandered district, um, your vote's probably not worth as much as somebody who is in a contested um, uh, in, a, in a contested district where, you know, you're actually having an election that is a, there's a battle between, you know, between the two parties. Um, and so it, it is, um, we always have to try to, I think, convince people that their vote matters. And it really does at the end of the day, because the reality is a single vote, it's, it's hard to make that argument. But boy, you know, if you get everybody turning out to vote, if communities vote um, in, in total and in, in substantial ways, um, that really can have uh, an impact. And that's really the only way in which you can bring about, uh, bring about change. You know, if, if you're dissatisfied with the president, you got to vote. If you're dissatisfied um, with your governor, you got to vote. Dissatisfied with your senator, you got to vote. Dissatisfied with your state legislature, you have to vote. If you're, if you're concerned about, uh, you know, a woman's right to choose, criminal justice reform, expansion of Medicaid, um, you know, sane, sane, sane gun laws, um, you know, all of those things are, are decided either at the state level or by the federal level by people put in place by voters. And, um, you know, as hard as it might be for people to see the change happen that they want to see happen, um, I can guarantee you the change will not happen, um, you know, if you don't vote. So you, you have to, we have to vote, we have to fight. Right. And, and speaking of, of, 
uh, what the National Democratic Redistricting Committee has, you know, endorsed. You've targeted, you know, 13 states in this election cycle to sort of, um, you know, to that have gerrymandered districts that need to be reformed or need to be switched to redistricting. But, you know, beyond those 13 states, are there, you know, how many others in the in the U.S., how many other states, you know, could use the redistricting to get rid of gerrymandered districts? Yeah, you know, we have limited resources. And so what we've tried to do is to look at those states that are the most gerrymandered and that have the largest um, populations. And so that's how we he came up with our, with our target states. Uh, and we're looking at those places where the gerrymandering is most extreme. Um, you know, North Carolina, w Wisconsin, um, those are among the, the most, um, among the most gerrymandered states. It's why, you know, our victories over the past few years in states like Wisconsin, um, Pennsylvania, Louisiana have been so important and why we've now focused on, you know, states like Texas and North Carolina. I mean, if you look at the makeup of the congressional delegations, totally inconsistent with, you know, how people identify as, as, as Republicans or as Democrats. Um, you have, a, you know, in Pennsylvania, you had a, 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 a congressional delegation that was far more Republican than, than it should have been after the redistricting was done. The, um, you know, I mean, Pennsylvania is a swing state. And after the reforms were put in place, uh, an election was held with fair match, we ended up with a congressional delegation that's just about 50-50. And that's more a reflection of what Pennsylvania is as opposed to the way it was before, when I think it was like 15 to three or something like that. You know, I mean, so, something really out of, out, of, uh, out of whack simply because of the way in which the lines were drawn. I think simply out of, uh, a problem that was entirely um, related to uh, gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. Is it? Well, I mean, I know, I know, uh, it's not. I know you're the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. Is there? I mean, it, it is historically. Is it always the Republican Party that is doing the redistricting, or is it has, or that is doing the gerrymandering, or is, are there instances where the Democratic Party could be better too? That's just another question. No, no, that's a good question. And that's a fair question. Um, there's no, there's absolutely no question that uh, gerrymandering has been a part of the American political system almost for as long as we've had a republic. And, and, and Democrats uh, have gerrymandered as well as uh, Republicans. Princeton did a study looking at the, the um, redistricting in 2011 and said that what Republicans did with regard to the gerrymandering efforts there was the worst of the past half century. Uh, and so, yeah, they're still, in fact, um, places where uh, Democrats have gerrymandered is a, uh, a House seat in Maryland um, that was a subject of Supreme Court litigation. We stood against that at the Na National Democratic Redistricting Committee. We stood against that. But um, you compare that gerrymandering, one seat in, in Maryland, as opposed to what you've seen in, in Wisconsin, um, Pennsylvania, before it was, uh, it was fixed in, in North Carolina, where whole states were, were, were gerrymandered and where people's voices were essentially um, trampled. Um, in by the, the partisan and racial gerrymandering that uh, that, that took place. So yeah, it, it, has, it has been done by both parties, but in the recent past, um, Republicans have been really adept at it, um, really good at it, and that's had a negative impact on our political system. And I, I think I'll transition to, I think, our last topic. Um, and because we were talking about before, um, just sort of getting people out to vote and the importance of people's vote. But I think, you know, and, and we talked about corona, the effect of coronavirus on the census. And I think, you know, the growth in, in mail-in voting for this, this uh, election, um, you know, is another direct result of, of that coronavirus. And I just want to get, you know, because I think a, a thing that, you know, we've seen recently is, again, the Trump administration's sort of attacks on the U.S. Postal Service uh, in, an attempt, in what is an attempt to sort of curb the mail-in voting, and it's already affected. I think yesterday, Pennsylvania uh, had to delay its had to delay its 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 early voting because of yeah. there were problems with the USPS. So, sorry, I'll stop talking. Um, but you know, what do you make of sort of the shakeups that have happened? You know, what what was your reaction when you saw that that was what was happening? Well, people need to understand. I mean, this attack on the United States Postal Service, another attack on you know an organization that is extremely, I think, is the most popular. Um, governmental organization in, in the country because people rely on the postal service for the delivery of medicines, you know, to get social security checks, uh, you know, a whole range of, of things that we rely on the, the postal service. And it's another one of those instances where no one's ever tried to politicize the, um, the postal service before. 
Um, but you look at what, you know, what Trump has said publicly. I mean, he openly admitted that he, he thinks that a barely functioning postal service will prevent, you know, more people from being able to vote. And that's going to be a good thing from his perspective. Again, you know, he's at odds with a lot of people, even in his own party in that regard. I mean, he installed, you know, a campaign donor to basically gut the postal service ahead of an election. Uh, in which more people than ever are going to vote by mail. It's a logical thing. You know, who wants to get out there and stand in a line in the middle of a pandemic? We saw those pictures in Wisconsin, those extremely long lines in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, people want to be able to vote and stay healthy at, at the same time. Um, so, you know, voting by mail makes a great deal of sense. And you have to think for a minute, you know, what is Trump trying to do? He's trying to destroy essentially a, a cherished institution because he thinks it's going to help him hold, hold on to power. So this is another place where, you know, where we filed a lawsuit to reverse a number of changes that were made at the Postal Service ahead of the election um, this, this November. And so, you know, we're trying to do the, as best we can to keep the Postal Service um, intact and capable. It, you know, it, it's got great people and, you know, left to its own devices, it's got the capacity to handle these increased numbers of votes um, by mail. But, uh, you know, Trump and, um, and his, his crew are, are trying to do all that they can uh, to cripple the Postal Service and to come up with an election that will, through cheating, uh, again, um, you know, favor them. Mm -hmm. How much of a risk is it to, I mean, this may be an obvious question, um, but how, like, do you see it as like a, how much of a risk do you see it to like it being a fair election in November, like it being a, a fair well, process? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's a major threat to mm -hmm. say to a safe and fair election in November, not only fair, but safe. Um, you know, a broken postal service is a, you know, a threat to the health and the financial well-being of all Americans, too. As I said, you know, medicine, um, you know, governmental checks come through the, the postal service. I've, I've mailed things over the course of the last, you know, month or so that take, like, forever to get to. I've gotten things from Amazon. They're taking, you know, longer now than, than they used to. I mean, everybody in the country, no matter what their political affiliation depends, you know, in some ways uh, on a properly funded, functional um, United States Postal Service and uh, you know, veterans rely on their, their prescriptions. Um, you know, the people to whom we owe the greatest amount are um, dependent on a functioning postal service. So it's not only about politics. You know, this is almost like, it's like collateral damage. You know, Trump is trying to ensure that he is reelected, but he's hurting people, regular people, uh, in, you know, in, in non-political ways, threatening, you know, our, our, our veterans who get, you know, the vast majority of their, their prescriptions from the VA, um, you know, through the, through the mails. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, again, you're, you're also very, you know, your, your message is, is, is vote, vote, vote. Again, what is your message to people who, you know, want to mail through the vote? You know, what is, what should they be doing? Cause I think another process that I've noticed that, that, that Trump often does is he will talk, talk, talk and get people talking about him. And that'll seem like it's, that'll seem like the world's ending. Whereas it'll cause people to forget what they're actually like, what they can do, which is vote. So what is your message amid all the, the talk and the hype of what people yeah. have to do with their mail-in voting? Well, Nigel, I think, you know, we, we have to understand this is a different kind of election year. Um, and it's not, my message really isn't just to get out there and vote. My message is, is to have a plan to how you're going to vote um, this year. This is going to be an election unlike any one in my lifetime. If you want to vote by mail, request a ballot as early as you can. Uh, and, and then submit it as, as, as early as you can. If you want to vote in person, make sure that uh, your state has early voting and try to vote early um, to the extent that you can do that. But in any case, do not wait until the last minute. Make sure that you're registered to vote. Uh, make sure you have information on how you can vote. Um, if you go to IWillVote.com, that's IWillVote.com, it's got all the information you need about voting in, in your state. But once again, you know, have a plan. Don't wait until the last minute vote early, um, whether you're going to vote uh, in person or, or vote by mail. Have a plan. Don't wait until the last minute. Vote early. All right. And I, I think I have just two more questions, just two more questions. Um, okay. um, you know, I mean, you are, you're the former attorney general of the U.S. under, you know, under President Barack Obama. Uh, and I think a big thing that, you know, we've lost sight of is like what in the, I mean, I, I think we, we were also kind of warped by what uh, Attorney General Barr has done in his position in terms of what is the right thing to do. I don't know. What is the right thing to do? I mean, in your position, is there something an Attorney General would do 
ethically or, or it can do if they see a president attacking the postal service or politicizing the postal service, attacking the census as we've talked about? Well, you know, um, one of the, if you're the attorney general, you get to hang the portraits of some of your predecessors. Mm -hmm. You get to pick four portraits. And one that I had was of Elliot Richardson, um, who served under Richard Nixon and, and who quit being attorney general because he wouldn't do something that um, his president asked him to do, which was to fire the Watergate special prosecutor. He said, you know, that's something inconsistent with my duty as attorney general. Uh, and he resigned. And I had that picture up there to remind me that an attorney general serves not a president, but the people of the United States. And so if you, if you are an attorney general and you see a president going after um, the Postal Service, if you are an attorney general and you see um, a, a president engaged in a whole range of um, things designed to ensure his reelection, but going against um, the traditions that we have, going against the institutions that we have, um, you should consider whether or not you want to continue serving um, that, that president. And you certainly shouldn't use the Justice Department um, to help facilitate those nefarious plans of, uh, of the president whose cabinet you are a member of. Uh, people need to understand that what's going on now is not normal. And what you see in the Justice Department under, under Barr is not consistent with the way in which the Justice Department has acted in the past under both Republican as well as Democratic attorneys general. Um, he serves the president first and foremost as opposed to serving the, the people. And that is um, that's inconsistent with his, his oath as, as attorney general. It's uh, something that I think puts into really stark relief the importance of this election in November. We need to have um, both a new president and a new attorney general come, uh, come January of next year. Yeah, and, and my last question is um, sort of, you, you kind of touched on it before and how we talk about how everything is so, you know, everything's been so politicized by our president uh, or by, by his administration. And, and, and my final question is, you know, and, and it could go back to, you know, just get out and vote and make sure the people who are in office, you want to be in office. But, you know, what needs to be done to make, you know, it not be so politicized? Because I think right now we're at such a toxic moment in, you know, the country's history where, you know, everything, even, even, even in general interactions, people are scared to interact with each other because of how they feel politically. Um, you know, how do we get back to like being, a, being united in a sense, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, th this is a big country and we're a loud country and that's okay. You know, that's fine. That's, that's how, that's who we are as Americans. Uh, that's kind of one of the things that makes this nation exceptional. You know, we are we're, we're upfront about our political differences. The concern I have is that, you know, we are really polarized now into the, to such a degree that, you know, we can't even agree on what the facts are. It's one thing, you know, you can agree on the facts. The facts are the facts. There are, there are truths. Uh, if you agree on those, then you figure out, well, what do you want to do with those truths? And that's where the policy differences um, come in. But I think, you know, so we need to step back as individuals uh, and, and think about what is, what's important for the greater good. Uh, we have to have a greater sense of community. Uh, it's not always about me. You know, it's about what is it, it's about we, you know, uh, a lot of the time, or more often than um, than I think we than, than we do now. You know, wearing masks, for instance. You know, when people are actually, you know, <laughs> fighting these common sense um, requests to wear a mask, and understanding that you know, if I wear a mask, I'm protecting you. I'm mean, this protection, like certain protection I get from myself, but I'm protecting um, other people. I'm trying to make sure the virus doesn't spread into the community. And to see people, you know, in, I don't know, grocery stores and, and, and phone stores, you know, getting all upset about having to wear a mask. I mean, that's a, a sign of, you know, the deep polarization that we have that I think is at least in part a function of who our, our president is and the kind of way in which he has, uh, he has governed. So I think that, you know, we need to ask ourselves questions as, as individuals, but I also think we need to make sure that we change the structures of our government, you know, gerrymandering. We need to really fight that to the extent that we can, have a fair census, a fair redistricting process. You know, take some of the politics out of um, the way in which our structures are, are put together and then have, you know, political fights layered on top of a fair structure. Um, that, I think, will reduce some of the, uh, the polarization. It's going to take time. Um, you know, we're fighting not only against an administration that, that kind of um, sees this polarization as politically um, good for it. We're also, you know, facing, to be very frank, you know, certain parts of our media 
um, you know, Fox, that again, we don't agree on the facts, you know, look at certain things and, you know, certain truths and disputes those truths, dis disputes those facts for political gain. You have a major news outlet that in some ways is simply um, an arm of, uh, of a political party. We never had that before. And that, I think, tends to breed this polarization. If you only watch Fox News, you get a very jaundiced view of, uh, you know, what's going on um, in, in, the, in the real world. So, you know, media responsibility, um, individual responsibility, uh, a change in our um, political structures. I think all those things over time can get us back to uh, a better place. You know, we, it took a long time for us to get where we are. I don't think it'll take us as much time to get out of it, but it's not gonna be something that will be cured um, with the election uh, of say Joe Biden in, in November. It's gonna take, you know, it's gonna take longer, longer than that. But I think if we work at it, um, we can get to uh, we can get to a better place. Yeah. Well, with that, Attorney General Holder, I want to thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. This was, wow. a, and I enjoyed the conversation. I hope you did too. Thanks for having me. Yes, some uh, yes, some good questions, some some tough questions, but it, uh, you know, I hope we'll have a chance to do it again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Sure enough.